Why is the blood the life? The blood's the life because it contains red and white blood cells. The white blood cells are our internal army. But why is the red blood cells so important? They carry the oxygen. Oxygen is the most vital element needed for life. They carry water. Water is essential, 75% from the neck down, we're water. 85% from the neck up, we're water. And there's no reserve tank on the back, have you noticed? The only water that goes in is the water we put in. Some people say, well, what about tea, coffee, uh, soda drinks? I said, how clean would your body be if you washed them in then? Now, it must be water and water alone. The red blood cells also carry the nutrients. The nutrients, as we touched on in our last class, are necessary for the proper functioning and the proper building of our new cells. But something else that the red blood cells do is they carry away waste. And we're living, living machinery. And whenever you've got any type of machinery, you've got waste products. And in our afternoon class, we're going to be looking at detoxification in the liver and we're going to be looking in detail how the body gets rid of waste. It's a fascinating process. So when the Bible says keep the heart with all diligence because out of these other issues of life, it's the blood. That's what, that's what the heart pumps is the blood. And every part of our body is alive because of blood going in and out of it. A young man said to me one day, my, my doctor said that my pancreas is dead. I said, really? Is it gangrene? What's dead? You can't get half dead, a little bit dead. If there's blood going through that pancreas, there's life going through that pancreas. And within two weeks, that young man went from 90 units of insulin a day down to, two, down to 10 units of insulin a, lot a day. Was his pancreas dead? No, it wasn't dead at all. Remember what you say. Thank you so much for your advice. I'm going to seriously consider this because it often can be wrong. You've got to realise that. that <coughs> right. Did you know that 25% of people who are diagnosed with, with Parkinson's, it's an inaccurate diagnosis? Doesn't that make you want to say, oh, thank you so much for your advice. I'm going to seriously consider this. And you leave and you do your own research on it. Find out. Get sustained making. There are many books, there are many books that can describe um, different remedies you can do to your body, but the bottom line rests with us. And the beauty of, if you apply a potato poultice to a sore knee that doesn't work, you've lost nothing. That's the beauty of the natural remedies. Let's get back to keeping the heart with all diligence because out of it are the issues of life. Heart disease, high blood pressure, it's the number one killer in the world today. So we're going to investigate this a little bit more. When did it all begin? Well, let, let's look at 100, 150, 200 years ago. It was the number one killer. And depending on what country you lived in as to um, what the death rate was. But what happened? What happened to make heart disease the number one killer? What are the common theories today? Uh, cholesterol. Is that right? Cholesterol causes heart disease. Let's investigate. And so what medicine has done since about the 1980s, 90s, everyone has to go fat-free. Is that right? Fat-free? Um, maybe low-fat? Is that right? Uh, stop the butter and go on the margarine. Has that helped? <laughs> and what's the definition of insanity? <laughs> Psalm 146 verse 3 says, Put not your trust in princes. Who are the princes? They're the authorities in the field. It doesn't mean you don't go to them. It doesn't mean you consider their advice. But what does the Bible say? Put not your trust in princes, neither in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help, because they could be wrong. And it's important to consider that because they were actually terribly wrong with this. Am I right? There wasn't much of a response there. <laughs> <laughs> Several writers are claiming that it's going to take a whole generation to get fat phobia out of the brain. Is it out of your brain yet? 
Because the fact is fat does make you fat. And we'll be looking at that in a little bit more detail this afternoon. Now it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. So what else have they tried? What else have the princes tried to get heart disease down? Because it's number one killer. Uh, number two, um, everyone over the age of 50 on half an aspirin a day. Is that another one? Get blood thinner? Has that worked? No, not at all. And let me, let me tell you the side effects for, uh, so another one's cardia. Let me tell you the side effects of aspirin. They cause brain bleeds, eye bleeds, stomach bleeds. Interesting? No. And has it reduced heart disease? No. Oh, no. No, not at all. Okay, let's move on. What else have they done? Um, put everyone over the age of 50 or anyone who's ever had a stroke or a heart attack on cholesterol lowering medication. Okay, Let's, has that worked? No, not at all. But with this fat free diet, with this aspirin and with the cholesterol lowering meds, what has exploded is, is, what is our Alzheimer's and dementia. Because the fact is, our brain is the fattiest organ in the body. You know what it loves? Fat. <coughs> Cholesterol lowering medication. Let's, let's explore this a little bit more detail. Here's the liver. And the liver is the organ that makes cholesterol. And 80% of the cholesterol that the liver makes is made out of glucose. And 20% of the cholesterol that the liver makes is made out of fat. Now just this piece of information alone tells you it's not the butter on the bread, it's the bread under the butter. <laughs> the wrong guy's being shot. <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually who he's hanging around with. <laughs> it's not the olive oil on the pasta, it's the pasta under the olive oil. So let's have a look at cholesterol. And by the way, the liver only makes it as it's required. So why is it required? Let's look at the blood vessel. Here's the blood vessel. And there are two main types of cholesterol that we're going to look at. One's called HDL, high density lipoprotein. It's called the good guy. Because high density lipoprotein or HDL, it's the carrier of excess cholesterol back to the liver. That's why it's called the good guy. Low density lipoprotein, LDL, is called the bad guy, but the body doesn't make bad things. It has a purpose, there is a reason. So LDL cholesterol is the repairer and the rebuilder. And you'll always find it where there's a need for repairing and rebuilding. But something else about LDL, it delivers cholesterol to the brain, and the brain <coughs> loves cholesterol. It's the fattiest organ in the body. And did you know that the food that's the highest in cholesterol levels is breast milk? And no babies have strokes or heart attacks, is that right? And the reason why breast milk is so high in cholesterol, especially that first month, because that developing brain cannot develop properly without great amounts of cholesterol. The Framingham Heart Study, I love the Framingham Heart Study, it wasn't funded by the pharmaceutical company or the wheat industry or the meat industry or the dairy industry or the sugar industry. It's an independent study done on the little town of Framingham, a little town in America, been going for something like 40 years and it was set up to prove that cholesterol causes heart disease. Well, it's 40 years later and hasn't proven that, but what it did show is that people with high cholesterol levels don't get Alzheimer's. You need a moment's silence for that. We had a lady come from, well, she was living in Australia now, she was 80, but when 
She was younger, she was a midwife in Africa. She was a midwife in Africa for 20 years. She said at one point, the African babies weren't developing properly. Their, their brain wasn't developing, their milestones were not happening. So they investigated and they found out that the mothers were watering down the powdered milk. And the brain was not getting fat. And because those little brains weren't getting adequate fat, they weren't developing properly. Let's go to the other end of the scale. What's happening to our, our elderly people today? In Australia, 1,700 cases of Alzheimer's is being diagnosed every week. Now that's scary, isn't it? The, the oldest and one of the most accurate history books we have is the Bible. There is no history of Alzheimer's. There's no mention of it. I don't think anyone here is 150 years old, but if you go back 200 years, Alzheimer's is very, very rare. It's a recent phenomenon. And there's a reason. Because remember Newton's third law of motion, to every action there is an equal and an opposite reaction. Has it got, has it got to do with this fat-free craziness? It makes no sense scientifically. It makes no sense nutritionally. It makes no sense at all. So what I'd like to do now is let's look at cholesterol in a little bit more detail. So what's happening in the arterial walls? When I worked as a psychiatric nurse in the operating theatre at North Wright Psychiatric Centre, we used to do basic surgical procedures on all site patients. And I remember one day we did a bypass and the surgeon was pulling the gristle, <coughs> like white gristle, out of the artery. And what are we told that is? Cholesterol. So that's blocking up the arteries. But what I want to show you is, and this is what is not often addressed, <coughs> and I think my inventor father, who died six years ago at the age of 92, why he instilled this in my brain. Why is it there? Is that ever asked? Why is it there? Why has the body done this? I have many books in my library at home, and I'm going to say them quickly, and you don't think you'd be able to write them down unless you're an expert in shorthand. But in my books for staying me, they're all listed there. The Great Cholesterol Con by Dr. Malcolm Kendrick. He's a cardiovascular surgeon. Notice the book he's written, The Great Cholesterol Con. He says, for the first time, normal levels of a normal vital body substance is being called a disease. It's a normal vital body substance and we need it. He says, I'm still waiting for the proof that fat, saturated fat causes heart disease. He still showed me the proof. And Ansel Keys, the scientist from Minneapolis who per first put this, this theory forward in the 50s, Ansel, Ansel Keys, his name is, Malcolm Kendrick quotes him as saying, we're, we're sure the research will come. Is that science? To say, I'm sure the research will come. That's not science at all. Science is based on fact, not a thought. Not a maybe. Another book is The Great Cholesterol Lie by Dr. Dwight Lundell, another cardiovascular surgeon. The Great Cholesterol Deception by Dr. Peter Dingwall, an Australian PhD. The Great Cholesterol Myth by Johnny Bowden. Uh, the Great Cholesterol Hoax, we're running out of words. <laughs> so Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, there were no more words left. So she called her book, Put Your Heart in Your Mouth. And in her first three chapters, she lists all the environmental poisons, the chemicals that come in, into the blood, maybe through our skin, maybe through what we're eating, maybe even through what we're breathing. They come in, they come into the blood, and the little endothelium cells that line the arteries, they're quite delicate. And it damages them. These environmental poisons in our food, in our clothes, in our personal care products, they're everywhere, they're everywhere, they're everywhere. They come in and they damage the arterial wall. Mold, living in a mouldy house, mold is toxic. It comes in, it damages. Mercury, how did they ever get away with putting it in our mouth? It's a neurotoxin. Can you believe it? It's time not to put your 
royal trusting princes. It's time to say, ah, oh, no, thank you. It's time to say, ah, oh, let me investigate this one before I make a decision on it. The amount of people that have said to me, if only I had time to think. The fact is, when a health crisis happens, it usually hasn't developed overnight. There's usually many years in the making. You have got time to think. They all come in, these environmental poisons, and they damage the cells that line the artery. Now, because of its low density, LDL is always on the edge. Because of its high density, HDL is in the middle. And so LDL is right there to do its job, which is repair and rebuild, plug up the holes, plug up the holes, plug up the holes. Let me tell you the story of a friend of mine. He's a um, craniosacral chiropractor doctor. He's a cyclist, goes to Europe every year, every year cycles 200 cars at a time. He actually originally was Scottish, he plays the vampires, got strong lungs, never drink, never smoke, plant-based. He was getting breathless. He's in his early 60s. And his friend, who's a cardiovascular surgeon, said, I'd like to do an angiogram on you. That's where they put a dye in. And what they found were his arteries were 80% blocked. When you've got 80% blockage there, you're not getting a lot of oxygen, that's why the person gets breathless. The delivery system is greatly compromised, so you're not getting the delivery. So he was rushed into hospital and I think he had two or three bypasses. What they do is they cut out the artery in the heart, cut out one from the leg, sew it in, that one's not quite as strong as this one. I, I talked to him, a few weeks after his operation, he said, Barb, it's genetics. <laughs> I said, well, it's like this, David. Genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. Nah, nah, doctor said it's genetic. Put not your trust in Prince. Do you know they get it wrong sometimes? How much did we look at this morning and they are attributing to genetics now? 5%. So he came and attended our program, and I was intrigued to know why. And how many people would look at him and say, huh, what's the point of eating plants? What's the point of exercising? Look at him. But there's a reason. Proverbs 26, verse 2, the proverb said, the curse causeless shall not come. It's old English. I love the old English. It means no curse, no problem happens without a cause. There's always a cause. That's why we must always investigate. I said, tell me about your childhood, David. And we're going to look at David's arteries and we're going to look at what happened. I said, tell me about your childhood, David. He said, oh, it was, it was pretty good. He said, mum and dad, though, they were chain smokers. Chain smokers mean before this cigarette's out, another one's being like lit. So chronic, chronic smokers. So what's, what's David breathing in all his life? He's breathing in toxic smoke, passive smoke, it is said, is more toxic than even the person that's smoking. And it is estimated there are about 7,000 chemicals in cigarette smoke. So what's happening to young David's arteries? I'd like to suggest that by the age of 15, he had something like already 20, maybe 30% build up. But you don't know. You don't know. In fact, the first sign that this is happening inside is usually sudden death. And we'll look at why that is in a minute. And then, in his early 50s, David decided he wanted to put on muscle. So he started eating tuna every day. We had a tuna fisherman do our program. He said, we catch 10 foot tuna. When mercury goes into the sea, it's heavy, so it settles to the bottom. Then the, then the crustaceans, you know those crustaceans that are cleaning up the ocean? I think they're called lobster, prawn, oysters, seaweeds. The little fish eat the seaweed, then the bigger fish eat the little fish, then the bigger fish, and then the... So 
What's happening with mercury is it's bioaccumulative. What that means is the bigger the fish, the bigger the accumulation of mercury. So David's having huge amounts of tuna to put on muscle because as a plant-based man, he was eating a lot of this, a lot of bread. I'm surprised at how many people that become vegetarians, they don't replace the meat. They stop eating the meat and eat bread, pasta, uh, cereal, and cakes, biscuits, donuts, we're just going to say cakes, etc. because there's a whole pile of them, muffins, croissants, all of that, pizza, another high carbohydrate, pasta, we've done pasta, rice, rice is another pure carbohydrate, potatoes, another, another big carbohydrate, it's all right, I'm not saying stop the potatoes, my husband would never forgive me. But on top of all the others, you've got a high carbohydrate meal. Pure crystallized acid extracted from the sugarcane plant. And this was David's food. And no wonder he's not putting on muscle. Because muscle requires the three essentials. What are the three essential food groups? Three essential food groups are fiber, our gastrointestinal tract needs fibre. The microbes living in our gastrointestinal tract are fed by fibre, stimulates movement, and it's in fibre part of food you get a lot of your minerals. And in our last class, we looked at the importance of minerals. Protein, protein's the building blocks of the body. And often on this high carbohydrate diet, protein is lacking fat. That's the other essential. But the carbohydrates, of which we have a huge list here, are actually the non-essential food group. Carbohydrates are not bad. We like them. No, they're not bad. It's just that what David was doing, he didn't even realise what he was doing, he was overdoing the non-essential and missing out on the essential. Especially when he heard the rhetoric, stop the fat, it'll give you heart disease, stop the fat. So here he's on virtually a fat-free diet, eating huge amounts of carbohydrates. You see, these are the three food groups that keep the food in the stomach longer, stop you getting hungry. So he's, he's eating huge amounts of this. They used to say carb loading, carb loading, they don't say that anymore. Because carb loading gives a quick high and then a corresponding dump. These are the three food groups that give the steady, consistent delivery of fuel. Within six months of having tuna every day, David began to show signs of mercury poisoning. <laughs> but what's happening in the artery with this mercury? More damage. More damage means more buildup, more buildup, more buildup. Something else is happening with David on his high carbohydrate diet. All through our blood are little protein molecules. And when you've got that high carbohydrate diet, it causes a release of high glucose. And whenever you've got high glucose, you've also got the problem of too much insulin release. But what David was having is high glucose in the blood and the uh, excess glucose was connecting with the protein molecules. And what happens now, they're called ages, they actually become sticky, sticky. And they can move. And <coughs> we've got an area here that is particularly narrow and one of these moves and ah, oh, stuck. If it gets stuck in the carotid artery, that's a stroke. If it gets stuck in the cardiac muscle, that's cardiac arrest. Can you see it's not one thing? It's a whole lot of little things. So David came to our retreat. And David heard all of this. And David's eyes were isn't that true with so many people that don't realise? It's like 
like when people used to say to me, Papa, what can I do to prevent COVID? I say, stop watching the news. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
I said I've not given the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. What a sound mind does, it assesses this. And that's what David did. He came to our retreat, he heard this, he realized his problem, too many calves, not enough fiber protein. Cereal and toast for breakfast, sandwiches for lunch, pasta for tea. What's he having? Overload of carbs. Carbs aren't bad. We love them. It's only when they're overdone and refined. Got that? Yes, we have potatoes every day. I'm married to an Irishman. You can't serve them that meal without potatoes. <laughs> the Asians have thrown me out of Asia if I said rice is no good. And when I went to Italy, I discovered that pizza and pasta, they're more kept for special occasions. Mostly they're eating thick vegetable stews. This is traditional. And in the city, this is fast food. When you live in the country, there's not fast food. Fast food is fruit and veggies. And because most people live in the city, we've lost the conception of amounts and proportions to eat. Fibre is an essential nutrient. Protein is an essential nutrient because 50% of the membrane around every cell in the body is protein. And 50% of the membrane around every cell in the body is fat. Except for the brain cell, it's 70% fat. Fat is stored within the body. Some reasons why they should be the main foods. So David immediately began to change his lifestyle which is easier, we still don't have to drink. We don't serve any coffee or alcohol, lots of water. A couple of days on juices, we'll define it this afternoon when we look at the liver. He learnt about plant proteins. So what are your plant proteins? So your plant proteins, in Genesis 1.29, God said, Behold, I'll give you every herb-bearing seed. What's a seed? A seed is a grain. A seed is a legume. A seed is a seed, says me seed, sunflower, chia seed, and a nut. And God said, The seed to you it should be for meat. What does that mean? That's the main substance of your diet. And nuts and seeds, particularly, they're your great source. Protein, protein also nuts, protein in seeds, protein in legumes, and grain, it does have some protein, but grain is high in, in, uh, in carbohydrates. If you'll notice, all of these, particularly the majority of them, are from the carbohydrate, from the grain section. The high carbohydrates from the grain section. We need a balance. And there is one grain that people predominantly eat and we find it in bread pasta we can do about 10 kicks there donuts croissants biscuits cakes pizza so majority on our carbohydrate list are from wheat and the wheat was changed in the 1950s and that change in the wheat changed the structure and that structure caused the, the uh, starch structure to go too high and it caused the protein or the gluten structure to become more complex. I've got a friend who just retired as a physician and she said, 40 years ago, you never heard of gluten intolerance, no? Mm, 20 years ago, a little bit. Today, it's out of control. It's because of the hybridized wheat. Cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease. Cholesterol is the result of damage to the arterial walls. So what David did, he started drinking more water. He started eating a plant-based diet. And it's very difficult, unless you have another angiogram, to know if this is totally clear. So I was talking to a Dr. Agatha Thrash in the US, and she she told me the story, she's dead now, if she was alive, she'd probably be 100, but she told me the story of a lady that came to their retreat in her 70s, 
She was an alcoholic. She'd had a angiogram and they found 80% blockage in her arteries. So they didn't want to operate her on her because she was an alcoholic and they knew she might not survive the operation. So her family shouted her to go to the health retreat. At the health retreat, uh, there's no coffee, there's no alcohol. First couple of days on juices, and we'll look at that this afternoon, the, the juicing program, the detoxification program. A bit hard, first couple of days, but by the third day when she started eating and the nourishing food came in, she started to feel great. In fact, her mind became clear. By the fourth day, she was walking, she was feeling great, she was starting to sleep better. She started to read some little books they had at the retreat and she, she discovered God and she surrendered her heart to God and she said that, that that 10 days of the retreat was the happiest days of her life. In fact, at the end of the retreat, she felt so good, she said to Agatha, can I stay? <laughs> so they found her a little room, they felt for her and she helped with the laundry. Next 10 months, she was up every morning exercising was out in the country, so she was loving the environment. And then an embolism in her brain burst and she died. She died very quickly. And so Agatha, being a medical doctor, she did a post-mortem on her. She was intrigued to know, this is 10 months after the angiogram when she had 80% blockage. So she did a post-mortem and her arteries were clear. I thought it was a fascinating story because it's difficult always to judge, well, what are they? Well, what are they? But in a good way is you're not as breathless. Because if the person's not as breathless, it means more blood is going through those arteries. So yes, they can be clear. That's the good news. We had a couple of nutrition students doing our program and I mentioned this to them and they said, oh, we were told it cannot be cleared out. But not your trusty princess. They could be wrong. I'm not against doctors. Some of my best friends are doctors. I think most doctors are ethical, but the pharmaceutical company is not ethical. And I believe the doctors have to get to the point where they don't put their trust in the pharmaceutical company. So we're looking at what they've done to lower heart disease. Has cholesterol lowering medication, has that lowered heart disease? No, not at all, not at all. What does it do? What does the cholesterol lowering medication do? Lipitor, Crestor, um, they're probably two of the main, and also statin drugs, all your statin drugs are cholesterol lowering medication. What they do is they block the pathway in the liver that the liver uses to make cholesterol. That's how they get the cholesterol levels down. That, that, that same pathway that the liver uses to make cholesterol, it uses to make coenzyme Q10. And what's coenzyme Q10? That's your heart protective enzyme. So someone can go on cholesterol lowering medications with the thought or the hope that it'll reduce their risk or tendency to heart disease, but it can actually increase it because they've now lost coenzyme Q10. We've got a book at home, it's written by uh, Dr. Dwayne Graveline, who's a medical doctor and an astronaut. And he went, I think he was late 40s, went to have his usual blood test. And the blood test showed that, and this is American levels, his blood test showed that his cholesterol levels were 200. So on Australian, I think English standards, UK standards, that would be, probably 7.5. And the doctor said, ah, a bit too high, I want to get it down. So he put him on Lipitor. Six weeks later, his wife found him out in the garden. He didn't know who she was, he didn't know who he was, he didn't know where he was. So they stopped the Lipitor, and within 48 hours, his mind was clear. 10 months later, he goes back for his yearly blood test. Doctor does the blood test, and cholesterol levels. I want you to go back on Lipitor. And he said, I'm not going to go back on that. I nearly went mad on that. He said, oh, that's very rare. Why did he say that? Because the princes, the pharmaceutical companies tell him that. 
says half dose. Why did he go back on it? Fear. No one wants to die of a heart attack. But remember, they could be wrong. So he went back on it. Six weeks later, his wife found him out in the garden. Didn't know who she was. Didn't know where he was. Didn't know. Stopped it immediately. Within 48 hours, his mind's clear. He put it up on social media, his experience. And within hours, thousands of years, same thing happened to me. The doctor said it's rare because the pharmaceutical company told him it was rare. But it is not rare. Because our brain is the fattiest organ in the body and our brain loves cholesterol. It needs cholesterol. So one more thing they've done to try and reduce heart disease is lowered the level. What do I mean by lowered the levels? Well, I was talking to a, um, a nutritionist in America. She'd been a nutritionist for 40 years. She said, yeah, my advantage is I was, I was trained in university 40 years ago. And she said, 40 years ago, a cholesterol level of 300 was perfectly fine. What would that be? 8.5? If you've got a cholesterol of 8.5, what are you told? You've got to get that down, you're going to have a heart attack. You won't get Alzheimer's. What they'd like today, if they're dropping it right down, they, they would like people to be what, under five, am I right? Mm -hmm. you, you get down to five. In fact, if you get down to 3.5, the brain's not going to work very well. They've lowered the levels, as I just showed you. Has that, has that lowered heart disease? Has that reduced strokes and heart disease? Not at all. Not at all. So what can be done? What can be done to lower blood pressure, to strengthen the heart, to strengthen the arteries? There's a few things that can be done. And I'm going to use the acronym of my book. As it's called Sustain Me. The S means sunshine. Sunshine, the ultraviolet rays from the sun hit the skin and convert a form of cholesterol to vitamin D. And vitamin D is essential, not only for the absorption of calcium, but all the minerals. And those minerals are necessary to keep the blood thin. Those, those minerals are necessary for the strength of the arterial wall and so the, the beating heart. Because the beating heart uses two minerals to beat. It uses calcium to constrict, magnesium to relax. Calcium to constrict, magnesium to relax. So if a person is not having enough greens, or the greens are not organically grown, or they're on coffee, tea, sugar stimulants, they're going to be short in the calcium and the magnesium, and that's going to affect heart function. Best blood thinner, and I proved it by the live blood analysis. I've done thousands of live blood analysis, so I've seen lots of them. And whenever someone's dehydrated, I can tell the blood's not moving. So you support her. There's a time to drink water and there's a time not to drink water. When shouldn't you drink water? Well, ideally not with your meals because digestion is a chemical process. And water, what does it do to our chemical reactions? Just dilutes them. We should be drinking before the meal and about an hour and a half after the meal to allow digestion to work well. So that's we breaking down our food and our blood is getting the nutrients it needs for our body to function well. How much water a day? Ideally, approximately eight. If you're not drinking eight glasses of water a day, just start increasing it. And the other thing that we're told to stop if a person has high blood pressure is salt. Is that right? Well, there's salt and there's salt. And the salt today 
it's just two minerals, which is sodium chloride. And sodium chloride is a two very harsh minerals. You see, seawater, it contains 92 minerals. And of those 92 minerals, 30% is sodium, 50% is chloride. So they're the first crystals formed, so that's scooped up bleached white, aluminium put in it so that it runs freely, another contributing factor to Alzheimer's. That's a dangerous salt. And let me show you why it's a dangerous salt. There's a bilayered membrane around the cell and the highest concentration of mineral outside the cell is potassium, inside it's sodium. And so when sodium levels go up, as it does when someone's sprinkling <laughs> sodium chloride on everything. And potassium levels drop because the person's not eating any fresh fruit and vegetables. That causes the cell to swell. Yes, that salt will cause high blood pressure. But there are salts like the Celtic salt, and the Baja salt, and in Ireland there's the Akil salt, and there's also the Atlantic salt. Atlantic salt. So these two here, I know they're from Ireland, there might be a Scottish one, which I do not know. But these Baja and Celtic contains 82 minerals. Now that's a lot closer than the two. So the doctor is right. That refined salt can get the blood pressure up. But the Baja, the Celtic, the Akil, the Atlantic, they contain all the minerals which in Matthew 5, chapter 13, the Bible says, Ye are the salt of the earth, if the salt has lost its savour. It's old English. How does the salt lose its savour? I'd like to suggest that this refined salt has lost its savour. It's lost all the other minerals to balance or buffer it. The Bible says, If the salt has lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden underfoot of men. And when I was in Minneapolis, I saw it. They throw salt on the road to melt the, melt the snow. And I thought of that first. That's that. It's got a use there. And that refined salt, 80% is used for industry. And if you get a teaspoon of that, mix it with a cup of water, and keep doing that till you've got a tank full of seawater, and you put fish from the sea in that seawater, they will die. body runs according to precision balance and it needs the whole salt. It needs those salts that still have the minerals. They're hand harvested sea salts. So when you take water, please also take the whole salt. Three, sleep. Let me give you the perfect mathematical formula. Eight hours to work, eight hours to play, eight hours to sleep. Got that? You'll be doing more playing this week when you play with these lectures. That's what you need. We'll look at that in a bit more detail in another lecture. We're looking at the sustain me principles for optimum health, trusting God. When you trust in God, you're trusting that God gave us a body with an inbuilt ability to heal itself, and it will if you give it the right conditions. This also takes away stress. Can stress cause a heart attack? Certainly in a dehydrated body, in a body that's not slept, in a body that's not exercised, it can tip the scales. But I maintain in well-slept, well-watered, well-sunned, well-nourished God, Body, that body copes with stress. And there's a great way to help cope with stress, and that's just to love the moment. Love this moment. We won't have this moment again. Love the moment. Love where you are. Past pain and future worries fade a little when you love the moment. Abstain. We've already looked at a few things that must stop. All the chemicals that are going to damage that artery. One of the first things people usually do when they go home is go to the kitchen cupboard, the laundry cupboard, 
and underneath the kitchen sink. Now what's under my laundry cupboard? White vinegar, sodium bicarbonate, eucalyptus oil, you'll save a fortune. And then you can spend more money on organic fruits and vegetables. And the alcohol and the caffeine and the right refined sugars, please start easing off them. <coughs> and also find a biological dentist and start to get mercury fillings out of the mouth. Six, inhale in Genesis. 2 verse 7, the Bible says that God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He became a living soul. This was not mouth to mouth. What was it? Breathed into his nostrils. Nose is for breathing. Mouth is for talking, singing, eating, drinking, nose and nose alone. When you breathe only through the nose, you purify the air, humidify the air. You also moisten the air, balances blood gases, and also pressurise the air perfect for the lungs. But what are the what are the gases? Oxygen. The other gas is carbon dioxide. You can have too much carbon dioxide, and you can have not enough carbon dioxide. When you breathe through the nose, it balances these. And carbon dioxide is a vasodilator. What's a vasodilator? A vasodilator opens the blood vessels. So better blood delivery through the body all because you're breathing through your nose. Now we went up Knock Hill this morning. Very hard to only breathe through your nose, but you can. You can train yourself. I've trained myself now. Because when you only breathe through your nose, it balances these blood vessels which opens all the capillaries and you actually get a better delivery of oxygen into the cell. When you breathe through your nose, it causes a release of nitric oxide and nitric oxide is also a vasodilator. Vaso, blood vessels open them up just because of nose breathing. And remember God's LSD, long slow deep, Breathe long, slow, deep through the nose and it stimulates your parasympathetic nervous system, which is your calming nervous system. Always through the nose. Number seven, nutrition. We've looked at nutrition. We've looked at the importance of eating high fiber, generous protein, protein great fats. What are the best fats? as they came from the hand of the Creator. This is your coconut and olive oil, they're the best fats. And nuts and seeds, avocados. Eight, number eight is moderation. Moderation in all good things. Please don't drink a whole cup of olive oil, but I really don't have to say that because we have got common sense, haven't we? It's very, it wouldn't be very nice. It's very concentrated. You don't need very much, but oh, on baked potatoes, open your baked potato, olive oil, and sprinkled well with Celtic salt. You know, God gave us taste buds for a reason, isn't that true? And it's the good oils and the salts that give flavour to food. Number nine is exercise. To keep the heart with all diligence, it needs daily exercise. And that exercise, in fact, there are several heart specialists that have come to this conclusion, Dr. Al Sears in his book Pace, and also um, Body by Science by Dr. Doug McGuff, the high intensity interval training. And the high intensity interval training, I can promise you, you will get it when you climb the knock. <laughs> We certainly got it this morning. And these are intervals of high intensity, intervals of recovery. That's when you look at the view, it's a very nice view. And that's usually done for a cycle of six. So there's no excuse for not exercising when you consider your high intensity is 30 seconds, your recovery is 90 seconds, and this is done for a cycle. What's that, 15 minutes? You may not be able to run, you may not be able to do push-ups, but everyone can climb the knock. You don't have to run.
crown that is walking up. And I said to Jacqueline and Michael, who are with me, I've done this before, and there are walk-arounds, but it takes longer, weird and all. And that's what I love about the high-intensity interval training. It doesn't take long. Now, most of the research has been done on exercise bike, because if a person's knees, ankles, hips don't work well, they're sitting and they can cycle as fast as they can. And recovery is just gentle cycling. Gentle cycling could be push-ups. You could do cycles, you could do push-ups, you could do chin-ups, you could run up and down the stairs. We're right up on the very top floor of the roof, so we're getting it every day, several times a day, when we walk up to that roof. I said to Jacqueline, we're gonna have very strong legs at the end of this week. The lift, <laughs> use the stairs. This is the best heart strengthening exercise. And Dr. Doug McGuff in his body by science, that's what he showed in his book. Also, Al Sears. No one's ever had a heart attack doing the high intensity interval training. You just gotta do what works for you and you just gotta start. And if someone says, I've got no time, I say, it's time to assess your time. Because we've got 24 hours in a day. That's a lot of 15 minutes. As I close, I'm going to give you two herbs that are particularly helpful for the heart and the blood. One is cane pepper. And in the book, uh, Back to Eden by Jethro Kloss, two doctors are quoted in there. One says it's impossible to abuse cane pepper. <coughs> the other one says it will never cause a lesion. Do you know what that means? You can have a bucket a day. <laughs> but I don't know anyone. If you're coming on blood, blood thinning medication, you might start with a capsule three times a day. If you can't stand taking half a teaspoon three times a day. If you're on um, rat poison, I mean warfarin. <laughs> you know, that's what it is. Put not your trust in princes, but they're doing the best they know. I will take two capsules three times a day. Is it safe? I can tell you what's not safe, and that's rat poison. But remember what the doctor said, you can't, it's impossible to abuse it, but I don't know anyone who's a bucket a day, but even if you had a bucket a day, it would not hurt you. And hawthorn berry. The hawthorn berry is the heart. In my book, Sustain Me, I have recipes in there for it, and we in Australia do grow Wolfgang Berry, but you know where we got it from? The British Isles. <laughs> so I know you have Wolfgang Berry everywhere. And I think, what are you doing now? You're going into the end of summer. It's harvest time. It's harvest time for the Wolfgang Berry. The Hawthorn Berry strengthens the heart. The blood pressure's low, it'll bring it up. If it's high, it'll bring it down. Remember Psalm 104 verse 14, God gave herbs for them? Service. They work with the needs of your body. That's what I love about herbs. So I thank you for your attention. It's time for